Welcome to Digging Deeper, Make Creativity Your Business Advantage. I'm your host, Jason Falls. Today on the program, I can almost promise your content strategy and brand messaging is going to get better. Tamson Webster is here to talk about her new book, and it is outstanding. Find Your Red Thread is available wherever you get books, and is and here is why you need to pay attention today. We all have brand messaging and talking points. We may even have brand pillars for social content, and most of us have the day-to-day -day executions of that content. But how many of you really understand how to thread those all together for a consistent delivery of that promise of your brand story with everything from your social content to email to advertising messages? Well, Tamson understands that more than anyone and understands more than anyone how to make that happen. And we're going to mine her for that today. Tamson and I have been pals for about 15 years now. She's absolutely brilliant. So stay tuned for this one. Speaking of brilliant, I've started using Marcom Gather for digital asset management for the podcasts. And I can tell you firsthand, it's made sharing files and organizing everything from images to show notes easier. There's nothing worse than wasting countless hours looking for digital files on your intranet, shared drives, desktop, cloud storage, or God forbid, even in Excel files. I've said goodbye to the days of overflowing, unorganized file storage and hello to finding files with speed and clarity. Marcom Gather is my new favorite digital asset management solution that empowers me and any team members I might add for the podcast here to stay organized so we can get back to the parts of the job we enjoy, like preparing good questions for our guests and such. With Marcom Gather, I can quickly centralize assets, eliminate unorganized file storage, and best of all, never lose track of my files again. I want you to experience Marcom Gather free for 30 days. Free trial, 30 days. Go to jason.online slash marcom. That's digital asset management. Super simple, easy, but powerful. And you can try it for free. Jason.online slash marcom. And here's a little bit more from them just because. Life's already chaotic enough. Your work doesn't need to be. Welcome to Marcom Gather, a home to organize your brand's materials and creative files so you can share them in an instant. Clutter be gone. You know, it's not often that I pick up a marketing or business book and think, damn, this solves a highly relevant problem so many people have right now. But that was my exact reaction when I uh, finished Find Your Red Thread, the new book on brand messaging and content from Tamson Webster. She is here today to tell us all about it. Uh, and apparently so our content uh, and brands together. Tamson, my dear, good morning. How are you? And welcome back. I am excited to be back. I am well. Good morning to you as well. Good, sir. <laughs> you're way too proper for my tastes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just, it's because of the early hour of the day. Yeah, it's too early and not enough drinks here we go all right so we got we gotta we gotta not derail this we gotta we gotta okay. help people here all right we can so, do this. so let me share uh with you why i found find your red thread so immediately useful um every day our team at cornet is building some segment or phase of messaging and content for our clients M my most hands-on manifestation of that comes in creating social calendars and messaging Mm. All of the clients we manage social for have social playbooks. They have brand guidelines. We have creative platforms and content pillars. And part of my job is to make sure those content pillars are served appropriately in social media posts. Yep. Now, communicating a big idea that has to be whittled down to a tweet or an Instagram post is not necessarily hard. But communicating that big idea consistently over time to seed and grow it within an audience is. And there are a couple of reasons I think it's hard that I want to tackle with you. But is that at or close to the problem brands have that your book solves? Or am I seeing it through my little social media filter? Oh, no, 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 no. You are 100% correct. So one of the places, one of the things that sat in my craw, as it were, through the various things that I've done in my career was doing very similar things as you're describing. I, I worked at an advertising agency here in Boston, and I was the head of digital content community strategy. And... I, th what broke almost every time was the connection between the day-to-day -day content and the high level brand positioning that we were trying to get across. And there wasn't an obvious way to keep it together. And so what we ended up doing, what I ended up doing is we always kind of came up with this thing that sat in between, right? We were trying to figure out, well, what is the bridge between 
the brand as we want to be it per, be to be perceived and that direct content with our community that's happening every day. Uh, and while I did it fairly intuitively back then, it it it's something I just saw over and over and over again. And the more I started doing one on one work with clients, it just continued to see something. I was like, well, you know what? Let me see if I can like formalize this bridge concept, the thing that will tie together the big brand and the day to day content. Um, and for me, that's always been messaging. And this is the approach that was the closest I could get to reverse engineering my brain and how I would build that bridge in between those two things. Well, it's a it's an engineering uh, a masterpiece, frankly, uh, honestly, I really was just captivated. And I, I mean, I've known of your ideas and, and I've taken your speaking uh, classes and, and whatnot before. So it all sounded very familiar to me. But the way that it has been threaded together uh, in this book, I think is really, really useful. So one reason I think communicating a big idea for a brand through social is challenging is that most of our brands don't have one audience, no. nor, nor yeah. do they have one brand pillar or big idea. They have multiple ideas. Right. So is finding your red thread in essence, whittling down your three or four to one and delivering one idea to one audience, or can you have multiple red threads? You can have multiple red threads. Uh, I mean, it's one of those things that it's almost like, the it's almost like inception right it's a tesseract where there like there can be red threads within red threads within red threads the way that i i really the the thing that i truly believe about a red thread is that that there is essentially one that that operates as the operating system of an organization it's the thing that gives rise to the brand it's the it's the set of of baseline assumptions. It's the point of view, it's the worldview that that guides why the company does what it does the way that it does it. So with some of my clients, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for the thing that ties all of it together. And they know that some of the, some folks know at the beginning, they're trying to figure that piece out just so that they can either develop a more crisp and clear brand or because they're trying to make it what everything they do more cohesive, either internally or externally. But at the same time, every idea, every product, every service, every individual message can have a red thread too. So that, because each of those is a way to make a th anything make sense, right? So it can be a little thing, it can be a big thing. Um, and what, what people find, and what, honestly, what's one of the most fun things about this work is that even when a client or a company comes to me to find the, you know, the red thread for this particular service that they offer or to position this particular product to a new audience. What we end up finding almost always is the shape of that underlying red thread. We start to get, a, get at what that larger, kind of more meta operating system, that operating code actually is. So the answer to all of that is yes. <laughs> Um, and it really is just, it, it's useful anytime you need to make a thing make sense. So whether it's, we need to make the big idea make sense of this whole brand or whether we need to, we need to make this individual element, this one piece of content make sense and also make sense in the larger picture, right. all of that can tie together. Nice. I think, you know, another kind of, rev and I, I, I'm, I'm sorry to seem like I'm blowing smoke up your butt about this book, but I really love the <laughs> oh, book. Oh, please go ahead. It's um, lovely. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, one, of, one of the other things that I kind of thought about this is I kind of sat and you know, got done with it and I sat there kind of thinking about, okay, what do I want to ask her about this? I really felt like this was kind of almost a masterclass on good storytelling. Hmm. You, you weave throughout the book, the five core elements of a story, which I think are a goal, a problem, the truth, defining change, and then action to make that change take hold. Yep. Now, those elements are intended to apply to how your audience hears your story. Mm -hmm. But I want to turn that around a minute. Do you think brands get in their own way sometimes by defining a goal that doesn't align with what their customers might be hoping oh, for? 100%. Or more specifically, <laughs> trying to solve the, a problem the brand thinks is a problem, but customers don't? Oh, yes. I, I would say that's actually one of the most common things that happens. And um, it's why I'm so insistent all the like it's the audience's goal it's the audience's goal and it needs to be in their language not yours um it is it is so common that <laughs> that marketing messaging and sales messaging in particular lead with here's the thing that we want you to want <laughs> and i mean if you just think about your own life i mean it is it is virtually impossible to get somebody to want a thing that they don't currently want 
unless you make it relevant to them in some other way, unless you tie it to something that they already do want. So my whole point is, well, why don't you just start with tying it to what they already do want and then draw the connection to how it can get them something else. Um, but I think we've been we've been served this idea that we need to be remarkable so much that we've forgotten how to be relevant. Mm -hmm. And if you're not relevant, nothing else matters. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing that's going to get you know difference may get someone's attention, but relevance keeps it. And that's really where it comes down to. It's got to be it's got to be oriented with like, what what your audience actually wants right now mm -hmm. and a problem that they know they have because you have to solve that before you can solve the problem that you think they have. Yeah. Now, the, the reason for, for context, the reason I ask that question that way is I think a lot of verticals and in industries these days are are seas of sameness. Like in, oh gosh, in yeah. bourbon, you can argue differences all day, but to most consumers, there's not a noticeable difference from one good bourbon to another good bourbon. Now there's differences between a good bourbon to a bad bourbon, but that's a, that's a different story. <laughs> so cars, it's a box on wheels that gets you from point A to point B. Yeah, they I'll all promise the same, the same thing. damn thing. Yep. Airlines are the same. Banks, they just hold on to your money to make interest off of it that you never see, then slap you with fees you didn't know you uh, have to pay to line their balance sheets. But that's just me being angry. Um, so there's marginal difference, I think, in most verticals from one to another. Therefore, in marketing, brands come out with some horseshit goal of providing something unique to consumers, filling a gap in the marketplace. When the truth is for most brands, there's no gaps. You're just putting different lipstick on a pig. Mm -hmm. Now, I promise there's a point here. So I'm, I'm curious if this red thread idea is a way to get out of that rut of doing the same thing everyone else is doing, or is that sameness a deeper problem that storytelling and messaging can't solve alone? Uh, the answer to the first question is yes, absolutely. It is a way to get people out of the sameness trap or out of the, <laughs> let's us, let us try to be different by saying the same thing that everybody else is. Um, you know, I saw that in my, in the years that I spent in higher education where they, you know, all the colleges I worked with would say, you know, we're student centered and diverse and like academically excellent. And it's like, well, no shit, Sherlock. Like if you're not, <laughs> if you're not offering that, then I don't like that's table stakes, my friend. So like, don't differentiate on that. Like that is the price of entry. Um, so that's the first thing um, is that, yes, it is a way to get out of that. And it isn't saying that the, the solution is to solve a different problem or even to produce a different product. It's to reveal more about why you do what you do the way that you do it, which is different than your why. It's different than your what. It is, the, it is, it is being clearer first to your own organization and then out to the marketplace about what your core assumptions and values about the world are. And I'm not even talking about brand values and pillars and the stuff that you're putting up on the wall just so it makes you feel good. I mean, the core elements of, of what you actually believe to be true about your customers, about the world, about your products, um, that, is a, that is in fact different because that is, when you are in essentially a commodity market, when you are essentially in a uh, commodity industry and you've got a lot of competitors, the one thing that you can count on on being unique is your point of view. Mm -hmm. And that isn't your actually your brand. Like I said, it's what gives rise to your brand. It's what gives rise to the, your actions and behaviors that create that brand in other people's minds. But it isn't, in, in fact, unique. At the same time, so to your second question, you're like, is this, is this just, you know, is it just, a, is it trying to fix a product problem with a marketing message? Right. Um, you, no, you, you can't ever fix a product problem with a marketing message. Uh, it, but this process, as I found over and over again, typically will reveal where the product problem is mm -hmm. um, because it will reveal that actually it doesn't solve a problem that people actually want or need to solve. There isn't a way to establish relevance. I've seen that multiple times. Um, uh, I've seen that the, where there isn't, um, where the approach just doesn't quite make sense. So it shows you where the gaps in the thinking are. And so it can show you where to solve them. And then there, there have been times when the result has been, oh, okay, but if we shift over here, 
which we hadn't thought about before, not only can be we can we be true to what our audience wants and what we believe to be true, but we can actually do something fundamentally different than what our competitors are doing. And that's 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 always exciting when that can happen. You hear that? They're coming for me. Um, it's about so, time. <laughs> all right, so let, let's put some connections together here. Uh, let, let's take brand A. It's a consumer product. Their marketing goal is awareness. They, okay. have, clever, they have a clever tagline. Yeah. They have defined brand pillars. Yeah. Let's, let's say their pillars are uh, quality and uh, sustainability and innovation. I don't know. Uh, okay. And maybe maybe throw style in there too. Woo! Yeah. yeah. Uh, so this might be asking an Apple's question for an orange answer, but how do they go about finding and defining a red thread that allows those four things to accurately and adequately support the brand consistently? Okay. <laughs> you know, easy question. Um, okay. So there's, here's the thing. The, the, the one thing that won't work is to say, our product as quality and sustainability and style and there was one more i don't remember what it was uh innovation innovation maybe it was. Right, yeah, innovation. innovation okay like you just say like i mean that's just telling people mm -hmm. um and there the thing is with the red thread what i have found is that it allows you to show people more of what you're thinking because a lot of times it forces you to actually define your terms Okay. See, a lot of companies use words like leadership and partnership and innovation and whatever. And we skate by by never quite defining what those things actually mean <laughs> for us. Because, um, but here's the thing, back to my earlier point, those things actually do mean something very specific mm -hmm. to each individual company. If you do the work of sitting down and say, well, actually, you know, if we were to answer that question, innovation is for us, or partnership is for us, what would we say? Then you're then you have that ability to have an element of a message, you know, a piece, you know, some aspect of thing to write more about, or some element of that red that thread that can be really, really powerful. So for example, um, I have a client that was trying to do that. We're like, how can we show that we're the best partner in this particular thing? And I was like, well, what's, what's your definition of partnership? Um, and we eventually got to this definition, which is that partnership for them is the mutual exchange of mastery. Mm. Now that means something, now you can tell, you're like, oh, you don't even need to know what the company is, but but that either will resonate for you as something you're like, well, that sounds like the kind of partnership I want, or sure. it's not, but it's much more meaningful than just like, we'll be your best partner in outcome X, right? Right. Um, so that's that's kind of the first thing that comes to mind is that it, it the 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 challenge of the red thread is that in order to fill in these blanks of it that goal problem truth change action it really does force you in certain cases to define your terms to define your point of view to define those baseline assumptions the result of which is that you end up demonstrating those pillars um, rather than just asserting them and I think fundamentally that's more powerful. Uh, and it's also a much better long-term strategy for messaging and brand building. Very nice. So your, your book ends with a lot of examples of red thread statements, and they all tend to follow that storytelling component pattern yep. of goal, problem, truth, change, uh, action, and are written very similarly. An example of one, just for anybody who hadn't read the book yet is, uh, we, we, we can all agree X needs to happen. So that's your goal. The problem standing in the way of that is Y and so on. It struck me while I was reading all these is a red thread, just a different way of looking at a creative brief. Oh, because could they be. sound yeah. a little bit like that to me. Yeah, they could be. I mean, I think, you know, I, th well, if we think of it in the terms of what's a creative brief supposed to do, well, mm -hmm. supposed to creative brief is supposed to articulate the what, why, and how that you're of what you're looking for. Uh, that's precisely what the red thread is designed to do because in order for us to understand, agree and act on something, those are the things we have to understand. So it's, it's, it, I really designed it to be a, the most efficient way possible to get those questions answered. Mm -hmm. Um, because I've worked in a lot of places with creative briefs and there's oftentimes a big old gap between what, what, you know, what the account executive puts in the creative brief, what, how strategy 
interprets that and then how creative interprets it that from there mm -hmm. um you add on to that that a lot of you know that that generally strategists are in short supply um one of the things that i was also interested in doing this is like well how can i how can i give companies a shortcut to strategy how can i help those more junior folks kind of not skip over the experience that they need but kind of quickly learn the lessons of someone who's done strategy for a really long time that starts to intuitively understand that you have to have these elements and so really it's just surfacing that so I think that uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I have I have seen it used as a stand-in for creative brief. It I, I think you know, in my opinion, it can be a much more powerful positioning statement internally as well, mm -hmm. um, because it it is again it's it 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 spends as much time on what you do and why you do as how you do it, mm -hmm. and I think generally in in the various documents that exist in agencies, creative briefs, POVs, um, you know, positioning statements, I think each of them tends to overweight one of those three rather than keeping them in balance. But it's the balance of those three that really give us the clearest picture of what we're trying to accomplish with something. Yeah. On, on, on that same note, uh, if I find my red thread as a brand, I'm finding a messaging platform, a campaign strategy, or, you know, I think in, I think somewhere, uh, in there, this idea originated, I believe, uh, from your work around creating really good frameworks for speaking about topics. Yes. How, how closely related, uh, is your work in helping people figure out how to talk in front of people? Uh, well, which I've taken your class. So I've, I know that part. I still have my little triangle around here somewhere. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, so how, how closely related is your work there and what the ideas that ultimately culminated in this book? Uh, they're intimately related uh, because whether they're spoken or written uh, or seen, the ideas have to come down to words mm -hmm. and they have to be, they have to be spoken as words. They have to be understood in words. And that's like trying to get this, this it's, it's, it is the proverbial camel through the eye of the needle, right? We have this big, beautiful brand, this big, complex, nuanced organization or product or service. And we have to rely on freaking little words <laughs> to get it out there. Um, and, and a lot of times, uh, and, and just the, even that image can tell you all the different ways it can go wrong, right? That, that we try to get it all through at once, not gonna happen. Um, we try to get the, like, the least useful part through first, right? <laughs> um, or, or we end up kind of, kind of putting the word camel through right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like rather than the actual camel. Um, and people don't understand what any of that means. And so, um, you know, the, the, you know, the, the red thread is actually what I developed to replace that, that triangle that you mentioned, um, because I wanted something that frankly was able to be more unique, uh, because mm -hmm. that, that, that prior approach that I had used focused on what people need to believe before they'll do something. Mm -hmm. um, but it didn't take long for me to recognize that there really are only ever three beliefs that we need to land with someone before that they'll change their mind. And that, that something is possible, that something is possible for them and that it's worth it. Uh, mm -hmm. and if you think about how most, companies would answer those beliefs, we would still end up back at a lot of conversations about features and benefits. It's yep. possible because we've done it before. It's possible for you because we make it easy and it's worth it because it's cost effective. But yeah, I mean, it's just, you end up with this stuff that again is not yeah. distinguished. And so I was like, there must be a different way to solve this. Um, so that was part of it. But the second piece came from uh, you know, that this, this, you know, the first and most urgent use for this approach was with my help, uh, with my work with TEDx and TED speakers. Mm -hmm. Um, and it ended up being the ultimate test of all of this, because if you can take a giant, beautiful, nuanced, you know, in, in a lot of cases, entire lifetimes work 
and and get it to be communicated effectively in the three to 18 minutes that you're allotted in one of those talks. <laughs> well, then you've you've done something. It means that yeah. you have to have clarity about what that is. It means you have cut away all but what is absolutely critical for someone to understand. And, and importantly, you've gotten it into concepts, not just words, but concepts that anybody can understand, which allows you to contain that larger nuance and sophistication. So while, it was, while its original form was there in, in speaking to folks, uh, I, I brought to it, as I said before, all of my annoyances of of like my prior <laughs> roles of you know why did why did band positioning oftentimes not stick and how do you create day-to-day -day content from a tagline and <laughs> how do i do that and why are why do most pitches suck and like w all of this and i was like well if i could do one thing in the world to to like is would it be possible like is is what would fix that like what would fix all of that? And to me, it came down to the thing that would fix all of that is having a better understanding of how people process the information that they need to make a decision to change. And so if we can figure that piece out and we can put our information into that format, then all of that, all of that gets fixed. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it, I, I've spent the past five years testing it and making sure that it does fix that and that it does work. Um, and I'm happy to report that it does. And, you know, it's, it's more than I could have ever imagined for it. Cause really I was just like, well, let me, let me just see if I can solve this problem. And then I was like, but wouldn't that mean it also solves this one? I'm mm -hmm. like, Oh, look at that. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So it's, it's, it's grand and glorious and it's bigger than I ever thought. And that, <laughs> however, is actually what a lot of people discover about their ideas when they start to put them through this process is that, you know, there's, there's, there's depth in our point of view, there's yeah. power in our point of view and to be able to surface, articulate and promote that point of view uh, is I think, what all of us are trying to do with all the other things that we've ever tried to apply for marketing and sales messaging. Right. Well, what, what I have learned from you in uh, not just this book, but watching your work over the years and certainly learning from you in the, in the public speaking uh, realm of things is that in both speaking and in, you know, marketing, putting your, your brand, your messaging, your, your messaging, your strategy, whatever it might be. If you put all that through a process with process with some rigor, Hmm. which to me sounds complex. It's actually at its core, ironically, simplifying the output. Yeah. Is that fair? Absolutely. I mean, my, my philosophy on this is, is actually rooted in physics. It's the conservation of energy law, which is you're going to do the work somewhere. And uh, I just, you know, I learned through experience that if you, if you didn't have a, a framework or a process that, to, to where you had to figure this out. You were just ending up spending a bunch of time trying to fix a bunch of broken stuff over and over and over again. Or you're spending a lot of time staring at a blank page or just a blinking cursor. Like, where do I go with this? What do I write about today? How do we actually get people to pay attention? And there's effort and there's time in that. And to me, that is non-productive, non-useful time. And so while this process you know, it's straightforward, not easy. I, I'll be the first to tell you it's, I got it as simple as I could. Um, but it's, it's hard for good reasons. It's hard because it forces clarity. It's hard because it forces choice and it's hard because it serve, it, it forces you to look at what you truly believe and value about the work that you do and the people you do it for. And, Sometimes that's hard and sometimes that's scary, but mm -hmm. if you do it once, it makes everything else so much easier. And that is the thing that I hear over and over and over again from my clients that it's like, yeah, the first couple of times rough. And then once they figure it out, they're like, I just do it all the time now. They're like, I can just do it on the back of a napkin. I'm doing it, you know, do it real quick before I go in to talk to somebody. Uh, I do it to set up, you know, all of my talks. It's what, how we, how we, how we plan out all our videos or all our blog posts. It just, 
it's a little bit of work in the beginning to make less work later. Well, uh, the, the way that I make less work later for me is uh, I insist on being the dumb guy in the room. And as you can tell, I've done that successfully today. Hardly. Uh, Tamsin, <laughs> where, where can people find the book and where can people find you on the interwebs? They can find the book at redthreadbook.com, uh, which will also land them where they can find me on the interwebs, which is tamsinwebster.com. And even if they don't remember that, I'm literally the only Tamsin Webster in the universe. So I'm not hard to find. <laughs> there you go. Well, we'll make sure we put links to all that Super. in the show notes and good stuff. Tamsin, uh, always great to uh, catch up with you. I'm looking forward to some time, FaceTime together finally yes. with Yay. you again coming up uh, this weekend. So looking uh, forward next to week or whatever the hell it is. All right, friend. Um, great to see you. Thanks so much for having me on. Thank you for being here, Tamson. I'll, I'll make sure everybody goes out and buys your book. <laughs> <laughs> Tamson Webster, ladies and gentlemen. Find Your Red Thread is the book. Go get that on the Amazons and on the uh, Barnes and Nobleses and, and, on the, and, and on the findyourredthread.coms and all that good stuff. It's, uh, it's, it really is a good book. I mean, Tamson's a good friend. You could probably tell that, but it's a really good book. And she's incredibly smart, which is why I like calling her a friend because she makes me smarter. So she's going to make you smarter. Go read the book. It's good stuff. Uh, speaking of books, I would be remiss if I didn't say that I'm, I still hope that if you haven't yet, you'll get a copy of, of my new book. Uh, uh, it's still, it's still new, right? Sort of. Uh, Winfluence is still available in bookstores everywhere on Amazon and other online retailers too. It's available in paperback or Kindle and now on audiobook. So you audible fans can listen to yours truly narrate the whole thing. Not quite in this voice, but still, Jason Falls' audio magic. Uh, you, can get, you can get the book at jason.online slash bioinfluence. And if you use the code FALLS20, you get 20% off. That's the, the, the hardback book, or I think the e-version there on the entrepreneur.com or entrepreneur press website. That's where that is. Jason.online slash bioinfluence will get you there. Use that code FALLS20 to get your 20% off. And then if you're interested in the audio book, which I hope you are, um, and, and the soothing sounds of Jason Falls reading to you for seven and a half hours, um, which is the total length of the book. You don't have to listen to it all at once. Jason.online slash audiobook. That'll get you to audible.com where you can get Winfluence. How about that? Excited to uh, hear your feedback. Uh, we got a, another really good review uh, on Amazon uh, or on uh, yeah, something the other day. And uh, I'm going to read it at some point. I don't have it prepared to read to you now, but I will read it on the show at some point because five-star reviews kind of get that treatment sometimes. So there you go. Um, ladies and gentlemen, next week on the program, my old pal Eric Schwartzman will be here to talk about his new book, The Digital Pivot. You public relations practitioners out there will appreciate him and his ideas, as will the rest of you. But PR folks will really identify with Eric a little bit more. He's a super smart man with a ton of experience helping businesses make a digital pivot. He'll explain what that is and how it might benefit you next Tuesday, June 29th at 11 a.m. Eastern 8 a.m. Pacific time right here on the interwebs. If you can't be there live on uh, Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter or YouTube, uh, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel at cornet.online slash dig deep. Uh, and that will get you to uh, the YouTube channel where you can subscribe. And then you can watch the replays of the show on demand. Or if you prefer to subscribe to just the audio versions of the show, you can go over to cornet.online slash digging deeper. And that will get you to a nice landing page where you can subscribe to all the various podcasty places you know, wherever you do your podcasts. Or you can certainly search for Digging Deeper um, on, uh, on your podcast app. There's a couple of other similarly named. So you might want to put Digging Deeper Cornet in your search. But that'll get you to the show if you want to make sure you don't miss it in the future. And we would hate for you to miss anything because I insist on being the dumb guy on the show. And that means we're all going to get smarter for the people that we talk to. So there you go. Uh, all right, now we have come to the uh, inevitable time in the program where I have to hit too many buttons at once. And if I do them out of order, then everything goes to hell. Uh, if I do it right, then we all go on with our day and nobody knows the difference. So uh, that'll do it for this edition of Digging Deeper, Make Creativity Your Business Advantage. If you like the episode, share it with a friend or colleague who might as well. 
Digging Deeper is a production of the Cornet Group. Find us online at teamcornet.com. Our executive producer is Christy Heiler, creative director Jason Majewski, associate producer is Ashley Harris. Our theme music is composed by Rex Banner. I'm your host, Jason Falls. Thank you for joining us, folks. Until next time, I'll see you on the interwebs. <laughs>